Now, if you check the INEC website, you would realize that it is just 111 days, 17 hours, 59 minutes and 39 seconds to the 2023 elections. Um, everyone is in top gear preparing for that elections. Nigerians are preparing to vote. Political parties are preparing to campaign. Most of them have started campaigning. And INEC is also preparing to conduct elections while election observers are preparing to monitor that election. And so everything is in top gear. Hello and thanks for joining us on Political Standpoint. I am Precious Amayo. Now, political parties are already releasing their manifesto. Um, APC has released its manifesto. In fact, PDP was one of the very first parties to release its manifesto. And most of these manifestos have come under um, scrutiny. For and against, people and people say, look, um, these manifestos are great. Others say they're manifestos that would never um, come into full manifestation. But we see that these political parties are already defending their manifestos and trying to convince Nigerians of um, every policy in this manifesto. And one of those parties is the PDP, uh, again, being one of the very first parties to release their manifestos. And we're joined now by the spokesperson of the PDP Presidential Campaign Council, Daniel Balwala. He joins us via Zoom. Good to have you join us. Thank you for having me. And uh, good. Is that more? Okay, we're still uh, afternoon. Yes, it's, it, it's afternoon uh, and a very sunny one at that. So it's, it's, I'm sure it's a good time to talk about politics in Nigeria. And I want to ask right. you, because there are those who, and I just want to talk about your candidate, um, Atiku Abubakar, and, right. and there are those who are wondering, um, and that's before we get into the manifesto, that he's run a couple of times for elections. He's been running for a really long time. And people are wondering, why is he running again? And, and why does he think that this time, he, it will be different, bearing in mind that he hasn't clinched um, that ticket in a very long time. Right. So um, Abraham Lincoln ran uh, multiple times, and I think either for four times or five, I can't remember exactly, before he became the U.S. Uh, president, even though some of the runnings were Senate, some are other posts. But he did that because of conviction. Abraham Lincoln believed that he had a vision for the American people, and because of that vision, he wasn't going to let uh, defeat of any sort to stand in the way of his plans. Short of the long story, Abraham Lincoln eventually became the president of Nigeria and ran that to history as one of the best presidents America, one of the best presidents Americans ever had because he was very pivotal in the unification and unity of the American people after the Civil War. Atiku Abakar kept running because Atiku believed he has a vision for Nigeria. Thankfully, in the case of Atiku, we were able to see the glimpse of it when he was vice president. He served from 1999 to 2007, and we saw the role he, the role he played in the economy, in the area of the economy. He was very, very instrumental to job creation at the time, especially when he cheered on policies that opened up our economy in the area of the telecom. He also, if you remember that time, we had so much of debt. But at the end of the day, we were not only able to have our debt canceled, but we were able to increase our foreign reserve. He led also in the area of uh, insecurity, because for the most part, President Obasanjo was traveling all over the world that time because of the heavy debt that we have. He was seeking for debt reduction and debt cancellation. So most of the responsibilities fell with Atiku. So we had that uh, opportunity and privilege of having a feel of his capacity, capabilities. And having had that, he believed that if he had the opportunity to, uh, you know, to stay as the president or to govern as the president, he could do better. And I'll give you just one example. Uh, he was recently interviewed in the area of power, why that they were not able to bring uh, power. And he said that as vice president, he personally went to President Obasanjo and gave his own suggestion on diversifying our power generation capacity. And at the time, he suggested that the federal government should bring in uh, a foreign company who that was going to help and that uh, his principal didn't see it that way. So at the end of the day, the short of the long story is we couldn't deal with power effectively. Now you can imagine if he is in that position, he probably would have played a role in that regard. So to answer your question in a nutshell, why is he running again after trying so many times? The answer is simple, because he has a vision for Nigeria and he believes that losing an election in the past will not stand in the way. Uh, one of the, the very many criticisms that he faces is the fact that, look, 
he barely lives in the country and that he spends some of his time in Dubai. In fact, some of his opponents say that he only comes back to the country to run for elections. And so some, there are some Nigerians who also think that that makes him out of touch at, with the real issues in the country. Why should Nigerians trust him? And bearing in mind that if he doesn't win this election, uh, some say that he's going to return to Dubai and not stay in the country anyways. Actually, to be honest with you, it is uh, people who wanted to blackmail him and mischief makers are the ones uh, pushing that. Because if you recall, shortly after the 19, uh, 2019 election, there was threat to his life when he had uh, he made a brief trip to uh, the to Dubai. And if you know very well, uh, after 2019, March of 2020, the whole world you know got affected by COVID, and most countries of the world shut their economy. He was caught up by that. He was in Dubai when the lockdown started globally. And that kept him away for a certain period. And he decided to turn that into opportunities when he enrolled to study masters from Anglia Roscan, Anglia Roscan University in Cambridge. Thankfully, all of this period he was able to use productively and now has passed his masters from Anglia Roscan University. And this he did when he didn't need to do it, but just to carry home the message that if you are a president that believes that education is critical to economic development and you have the opportunity to do that, go ahead and showcase it. And that has now become a motivation to a lot of people who believe that age cannot be a barrier. At any given time, if you need to refresh your mind, because if you're going to be a leader in the 21st century, you must have 24th century cutting age knowledge of uh, uh, development and government. So in a nutshell, this is the reason why he was away in Dubai. He has been absolutely in touch with people in Nigeria. Otherwise, how could he just come, as you are saying, from Dubai and still win the primaries of the party? When well, people thought come, that he was uh, not going not to have the uh, Just to, sorry about jumping in, but how come we do not hear from him regularly right. on national matters? Uh, because we've seen candidates, and not just at the presidential level, even at the gubernatorial level, right. Um, mm -hmm. Look at as National Assembly, House of Assembly, who, who say nothing every four years. Um, but on the fourth year, when it's time for election, you see them uh, making so much noise about issues that have been there and they didn't say anything about it. And, and so it almost seems like that's what we're seeing now. No matter so, the location, the answer, how come we've not heard from him in terms of national matters? To be honest with you, and you can verify that, in fact, he is the one, one in fact, the leading politician who has always been in touch. All you need to do is you can ask your research department to run his uh, visa account. I mean, I say visa Twitter account right to 29, even before 2019. You will see his everyday engagement with Nigerians on wide range of issues, issues that border on Nigerians, issues that affect the country, issues that affect us around the world, Nigeria's foreign policy abroad. And on all matters. So I am not just saying it for saying sake. You can ask your research department to run through. And you know, Twitter, of all the social media platforms, Twitter has come to be the most recognizable platform for matured engagement. You know, we have Facebook, but if you see presidents around the world, they hardly use Facebook. They hardly use TikTok, you know, for official matters. But when it comes to official, there is virtually even when you go to the U.S. government, even CIA, they have a Twitter account. State Department have a Twitter account. So, and that platform, which has you know, come to be the global alternative platform from the mainstream, he has been actively involved through Twitter with Nigerians in all engagement. So they are verifiable. They are not like Peter Obi that will say, go and verify. And by the time you go, you come back, there's nothing to verify. This is verifiable. He has always been in touch. And in fact, way above all other politicians, including those who are standing against him at the moment. You, you mentioned visa earlier, and I want to stay on the issues of visas. Um, there is he, you, your your presidential candidate just go back from from the U.S. and we understand. I mean, from the a lot of information given by the campaign council that he had come there for um, official duties, meeting with the State Department and all. But there is now a company um, claiming that your presidential candidate Atiku Abubakar could not get into the U.S. and that they facilitated um, his visit. And that he now owes them $5.6 million, I think it is. Uh, can you speak on that issue? First of all, uh, I do not know if you have seen the letter. If you do have, you will see that the date of the letter was 2018 and not 2022. 
So uh, to begin by dismissing that uh, Atiku Abubakar, His Excellency Atiku Abubakar, was in fact invited by the U.S. Department of State, just like Foreign Affairs Ministry. And that was how he traveled to the U.S. And his engagement with the U.S. government is not hidden. It is known to all. And he was able, in fact, on the visit, to extract the commitment of the United States government to that they will play a major role in ensuring that there is a free and fair process. In mm -hmm. fact, they even say they are going to issue uh, what they call measures of sanction on all or any person that interferes with the process of election in Nigeria. That company, unlike many other companies that will come, are just coming for black men. First of all, let me ask you, have you, uh, have you ever traveled to the U.S.? I know there is a point I want to drive. Have you ever traveled to the U.S.? Okay, so I will, I will, I will not disclose my travel history, but just, just make the point. Well, okay, let me, okay, let me, okay. So the point I'm trying to say is, if your answer is in the affirmative, mm -hmm. I would have gone further to ask, uh, did you have to pay money other than the visa processing fee? Your answer will certainly be no, because you know for sure that American government and American embassy does not sell visa. And in fact, if you're familiar with immigration law, you will know that a U.S. embassy would always say, in clear warning, anybody who receives or pays money in the name that they are going to secure a visa, if the U.S. government gets to know it, that that person will be banned from entering U.S. visa. So, I mean, so Mr. Bola, forever. why, who, so who yeah. is this company and why has this issue been lingering since 2018? Because it look, you are saying it's 2018 in the letter. So why is it lingering and unresolved since 2018? If you look at the letter, you will see that they, they don't even, there's no correlation with, uh, with Atiku Abubakar. It's like in that letter, I've read a couple of them. They are trying to say they enter into agreement with another company to offer services to Atiku. There is, in all the letters, there is no evidence linking any to Atiku. Either he has given his consent letter of agreement or anything. I will just save you the pain of knowing what is contract law. You are only bound by a contract you enter into expressly or impliedly. There is no evidence to that. As a matter of fact, I will tell you that Atiku Abakar has instructed his lawyers in the U.S. to sue that company. And, you know, under U.S. Foreign uh, Agency Act, any company that wants to offer services or serve as an agent to foreign government or individuals in the United States that company will have to register with the U.S. The idea behind that is that the government must know everything that is happening. Now, somebody can go and register because you're popular. On his own, he can just go and... Like the way we do campaign in Nigeria, you hear somebody will call a campaign office and say, I came from uh, Ilupeju or from Mushik, and I was able to organize rally, blah, 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 and this is the amount that I spent. Can I get a reimbursement? He has ever had communication with anybody. He has ever entered transaction with anybody but he believes this is a season. Anybody can just say, I did something and be paid. Look through the document, my sister. You will not see any linkage or correlation with that people. It's blackmail. And this time around, he has taken the decision. Probably in the coming days, administration of justice in the U.S. is very short. You will see by the time the judgment comes on their head. All right. So we're watching out for that um, action that now will be taken. But let's now delve into your manifesto. I, I was going through um, reports just... A lot of um, people have been and organizations have been scrutinizing um, the different manifestos right. and giving their opinion. And of course, it's been mixed reaction. But there is one particular one that caught my eye, which is Civic, um, C Civic Hive. And I know you know budget. Um, Civic Hive is a hub of budget. And so th their, right. their uh, analysis is the fact that they described your manifestos as policies built on huge assumptions that might not um, or go, uh, go well with the, the current structural limitations in the country. How do you react to that? First, I would have wished that uh, in your assessment or reading out their contents, you come with what uh, they use as parameter to say that it is assumption. Usually, let me paint this scenario. If you are an economist outfit or platforms or anything, and you want to critique on a manifesto, and you now say it is an assumption, you are supposed to bring out the element of assumption. So I, I only, in responding to you, I would only speculate what they meant by assumption, but I would have been pushed. I, I can give that, I can you, give that to, to you say, because it was stated, stated actually. They talked about the fact that you mentioned you will create three, three million jobs, um, that you also talked mm -hmm. about lifting 10 million people, uh, 
pop Nigerians out of poverty yearly and that that's almost mm -hmm. not feasible. And that increasing police right. workforce to 1 million um, personnel, that I, when you also look at the current climb, it's almost also not feasible. Right. Other issues which I, I will raise later, but I wanted to address these particular ones. Okay, so excellent. All these four items you have mentioned, they boil down to just one element. Where will you get the funding to do it? You know, because uh, of all the uh, manifestos that we have, of all the candidates running, the question that we have always been confronted by the media has always been, where will you get? And let me tell you why they keep asking that question. Because Nigeria is broke, number one. Number two, because we are paying for subsidies. So ordinarily, the money we would have saved if there was no spoil subsidy uh, would have solved some of the problems we are bringing in our manifesto. So the people are looking at it on the evidence of what is on ground. It is not feasible. Thirdly, they are also believing that uh, with the way Nigeria is broke, there is 27.7 .7 trillion naira that the next administration will pay over a period of three years because of the consistent and persistent uh, borrowing that they did. And fourthly, because this administration has always been borrowing not to invest in infrastructure as it were, or to invest in other critical areas, although they have invested in one or two infrastructure. But fundamentally, you have had the finance minister, the CBM, they've always been borrowing to feed, borrowing to pay people for consumption. So once a political uh, a candidate comes with a solution to these three areas, that means you will open up access to the money you will need to do that. So let me tell you one. If you know how much the country would save by the time you take out the first subsidy, it is enough to pay for capital projects. It is enough to pay overhead. And at the same time, it's enough for you to invest in critical aspects of the economy Say, for example, in transportation, you can decide to subsidize for the common man, those who go to work every day. So you take out the subsidy fuel, will go up, but then by the time you bring money and subsidize for their transportation, it means there will be some sort of a, a, a credit card that somebody will have when you're going to work, you tap and you go, that, or pro provision of uh, mass transit. All of these are part of our plan. But I'm saying that uh, in answer to the budget, once you're able to raise this revenue, you do that. And then the second aspect, apart from um, the removal of first subsidy, you see, the economic policies of this government has not been attractive to investors. There is money in the private sector. And then you also have private sector players that have access to foreign money. But the reason, the reason why nobody wants to bring in is because dollar is, will always go to a place where investment is attractive. It's a common principle. And because the policies are inconsistent, people are taking capital away. So every day we are having the problem of liquidity. You have had recently, in fact, even yesterday, Emirates continued to complain. I mean, foreign airlines that were able to collect money from their own customers, now they cannot access the money in the bank. The federal government arrested the money. This is one area. You see oil companies selling and leaving the country. So even domestic investors are thinking of how to take their monies abroad because there's no money. Now, if your policy is such that it is conducive to the environment, Rather than the money going out, it will stay and move within the economy. Uh, secondly, I did a, a research and I found out that if you see the amount of billions of dollars that Nigerians take abroad for study or for medical tourism, if that money is in the economy, it will take care of things. Now, with respect to our proposal to raise the police system, what you need to do, we are been, uh, proposing restructuring, all right? So if we do the restructuring, there will be a multi-layer policy. But the federal police were thinking of raising. Remember, by the time you, impl uh, you implement restructuring, the federal government will leave out some of the burdens to states that will deal with it. That means the federal government will free itself from overburden, you know, over too much responsibility. That means the federal government will save enough to now recruit the federal law enforcement and be able to pay them. That is one aspect. We can even go to the point. Well, the, the, the one million the police sector. personnel per day, is that for the federal government or also part of the restructuring? Um, are you saying that if you have one million uh, police personnel and then you, some no. of those police personnel well, would then be, would go to the, to the states? I, I'm trying to understand um, how that plays into yes, yes, restructuring. Yes, yes, yes. So in, uh, as, first of all, we are proposing restructuring, right? If the restructuring takes place even with law enforcement and states take control of their, of their police system, then there would have been no need for federal government to recruit one million police. But assuming in the alternative, because the minute you come into force, the restructuring of uh, the restructuring you are proposing will still have to take time. 
it is it has to come through constitutional reform. But if you propose to raise one million police within the country, as as at the moment, I think we have about three hundred and something thousand. So in other words, you need about seven hundred to make up for the one million. All you need to do is before the full restructuring where you can see that the police to the state, you have the capacity with the funds to be able to, uh, you know, to, to raise them. And don't forget, when it comes to national security, no amount is too much to spend. Mm. I will tell you later how to, to we are going well, to... Well, Mr. Gowala, I, I want to move to another issue, but I want to ask you, because when you then have the one million, uh, if, if you're able to raise that before the restructuring takes effect, what then happens when the restructuring takes effect are you still going to have one million police personnel as federal police? What, what happens? No, again, that, no. that then looks like it's my, just too I, much. I made the argument. I made the argument in the alternative. Forgive me. What I'm saying is, if we come, let's say from day one, the structuring is in full place, there would have been no need to recruit one million police because states and even local government will have their multi-layer policing system. So even the three hundred thousand police will be enough to take care of federal police system. But you know why the number of police will have to increase? You see, we're going to have, uh, although it is Nigerian police, but they have similar responsibilities, forest police, coastal guard police, all these things you discover at the end of the day, that number, as we are talking about, will not be more. So my argument is in twofold, I told you, in the alternative. If, the, if we are coming to day one with full implementation of restructuring, there will be no need to recruit one million police because states and local government will already have created their own police. So the 300 and something thousand police we have will be sufficient. But you know that when you, the day you are sworn into uh, the presidency, that day the constitutional reform has not taken place. So because it has not taken place, you will need further advice. Even though you have it as a proposal in your manifesto, you need further advice on the best approach you can give mm. in dealing with that uh, insecurity. We're even looking to expand the military. It's not just the police. We're even looking to expand the military. And uh, let me tell you this, my sister. You see, and once so, the economy Mr. is Boyle, positioned... I have, I have just like... Let me, land. To let, me, let me just land this All one. Right. Let me just land this one. Once your economy involves the free market enterprise, private sector participation in its fullest, it will create so much of jobs and it will generate so much of income that the finances which you fear, because it's not just the police that we're going to spend. There are so many areas we're looking to invest in. Police system cannot be a blockade or a hindrance to what we intend to do. And I want to take a say this in, in closing with respect to this point, that no manifesto is cast in stone as sacrosanct. Mm. What leaders do is that they provide the vision. When they come into office, as they begin to appoint people into various areas of government, the people will advise accordingly. So yes, even if in the proposal we say we are going to recruit one million police, it is not cast in stone. The day will come into power if it is based on the advisory we get from law enforcement because of the possibility of restructuring, the speed with which that can be achieved, we can always tweak with our policy objective. But fundamentally, the message to the Nigerian people is that there will be enough law enforcement in Nigeria. All right, so I have just like a minute left, but I, I just don't want you to leave without addressing this particular one, which is the fact that you have said that you want to raise Nigeria's uh, GDP per capita from $2,000 to $5,000, and that's by 2030. Um, we know that that's very rare, especially when you look at the population explosion around the world, especially in Nigeria. Only about five countries mm. have been able to do that in about, I think, 15, 20 years. So how, how was the plan? The good thing is that you mentioned population explosion. So all you need in order to raise the GDP is to convert that population into productive population. Once there is a free market enterprise, I mean, economy, where the people are, have access to opportunities. Like, for example, when we propose vocational studies, access to loans uh, in the area of agriculture, science and technology, our focus in the area of I ICT. Now, you begin to convert the population into a productive population. China is that popular, and uh, the population of China is that much, but they have productive economy. Why? Because the population is, has been able, they are they're able to convert the population into a productive population. If you look at our own, un unemployment is about, I think, 33%. Underemployment, about 20-something percent. So this is all you need to do. If you're able to convert that unemployment into employment, underemployment into a level that is required, then you involve the private sector, you can achieve that. And I'm glad you said there are countries that are able to do it in 20 years. 
And as we are progressing, that means there are other countries with the right objective. They will probably achieve that in lesser time. All right, we're following your every development within your party and your manifesto as well. We know that your campaign has started. We're also following that. And then we'll, I, I'm sure we'll have you from time to time. There's just a lot of... <laughs> as you can see the death. I want to talk to you about, but um, our time is up. Thank you so much for talking to us. Spokesperson for Thank the for PDP Presidential Campaign Council, uh, Daniel Boala. Thank you. All right, you're watching Standpoint. We'll take a uh, break now. When we return, we'll return to the APC manifesto. Stay with us.